So we're here with Ben Allenak, who's Professor of Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge. Um, and we're the editors of PLUS magazine, Marianne. And Rachel, hi. Hello. And we're here because there's been, yesterday, there was an announcement um, at CERN about some data they collected and analysed recently. So Ben, can you tell us more about what they announced yesterday? Yeah, so we were all sitting around in our physics departments watching this end of year roundup from uh, CERN. And um, yeah, so the, well, they, they announced the results of lots of searches for new particles, for instance, and, and one of them even had a sort of quite intriguing uh, bump uh, in the data. So this is one where you look for two particles of light coming out with high energy, and of course that's the that's the channel in which the Higgs boson was uh, discovered. So the Higgs boson was discovered when the energies of these two particles of light was 125 times the energy in protons. Um, and now uh, they seem to, at least one of the experiments, fairly unambiguously, has seems to have an excess of these uh, collisions where they have 700 times the, the um, energy in a proton. So, so those, um, those particles of light, they, they originate from collisions of protons in the, in the tunnel where they get acceler accelerated um, into each other. But they have merged with more energy than would would have been predicted. Yeah, that's right. So you get, uh, in fact, you get um, photon two pho uh, collisions with two photons with all kinds of energies. But if you predict the uh, frequency at, at which different energies come out, you find that they fall off at much higher energies very quickly. Uh, but then um, on this falling background, actually, I can show you on the board. Just draw a little picture here, is okay. So if we plot something, it's really the invariant mass, but something that's like the energy of the photons on the horizontal axis, and we have the number of collisions on the vertical axis, what you expect is something falling like this. And this, is, the, this is the predictions from the standard model as understood by physics at the moment. That's right. Yes. So ordinary processes give you, give you this. And if you've got a particle decaying into uh, two of these uh, photons, they give you an extra contribution, which looks like a bump. So they all come out with one energy. Um, and the energy is actually gives, tells you what the mass of that uh, particle is. Um, and OK, there's the, um, some uncertainty on uh, the energy, and so you get some spread. But, but basically, you get a bump on the falling background. Now, what, what the ATLAS experiment um, did, saw, if I plot kind of their data, it looks roughly like this. So you can see in the middle here, there was a difference between, they got, they got too many um, yeah. of their collisions. And this, this is based, these plots, as we you told us a uh, few years ago now with our coverage of the Higgs discovery, these plots are essentially histograms, aren't they? So they're essentially That's counts right. of how many collisions gave that, that that energy level for the photon. That's right. So it's a really simple kind of accounting system that comes out. That's right. And this was in in so if you just look in this region, um, and there they was a three. Too many. Too they many. counted too many. Yeah. And uh, you know, in statistics, there's three sigma um, too many in that one region. That's not enough to claim discovery. Um, in particle physics, we use a more rigorous um, definition of a discovery, which is five sigma. Um, and the sigma levels mean um, essentially quantify how likely, when you did these tests, it was that you find a bump just by accident. Just by, that yeah. there was nothing there. And so uh, I can't remember the exact numbers. So, so the sigma level that's normally used in... I think five sigma is one in, th one in three and a half million. Yeah. Or is it one in 35 million? I'm not sure, but it's a very, very large number. Th this level yeah. is, is more like one in a thousand. So if you did a right. thousand different LHCs, yeah. you would expect uh, one of them to have a bump like this uh, where, where, where it is. Yeah. Now, but, but you have to do this look elsewhere effect because yeah. the bump could have appeared up here or down yeah. there. And that reduces it actually to only 1.4 sigma. So taking that into account, it's not that right. uh, it's not that uh, significant. So, um, but it was one of the reasons that it was interesting yesterday was because both experiments found a bump at the same energy level. That's right. So CMS also um, has a bump right there. So 
Um, if you've got two experiments with a bump in the same place, then you can use one to locate it, yeah. and then you don't have to use the look elsewhere effect right. in the other one. Right, so, right. You, so, so you could say down this down. is kind of three sigma. However, the CMS's bump uh, looked a bit more shape, shaky. They had several bumps actually, and even the one here wasn't the most, uh, wasn't the strongest. But still, um, it's, it is intriguing that they're in the same place. And what does it mean? I mean, what does the bump imply? Well, it's a particle, a mass of 700 times the mass of the proton, if, it's, if it sticks around. Um, it would decay into, obviously, into two, uh, two particles of light, just like the Higgs boson. So it could be another, another Higgs boson. People are playing with those models. But you a have much to, heavier one. Much heavier yeah. one. Um, you'd have to tweak, it, it, even that's not enough, you have to add some extra particles because if you just have an, if you just try and add an ordinary extra Higgs boson, usually it doesn't decay often enough into two photons and it will decay in other ways, for example into two W bosons, much more often and that hasn't been seen. Um, so that means there have to be other particles around too? Um, yeah, so that's right, so that these people, people they're called uh, vector-like quark representations, but um, you know, if, if it's right, they're, pre they're appearing in quantum fluctuations uh, and producing two photons. But um, what you really want to see is, is find these um, e heavy vector-like quarks directly and uh, see them in, in the collisions. So what does that mean in comparison to standard theory or the standard model, as it's called? Yeah, well, this is, this is a different... You, you'd have to change the standard model. It would, um, it would be wrong at least how it's written and it would have to be modified and, and changed if this sticks around. So it's quite a significant... If it, if it sticks around, it, it will be significant for sure. Yeah, it will hit the newspapers. And how long... So there's a certain amount of evidence, maybe one point something sigma, maybe three sigma. I mean, how long, given the experience of nailing down the discovery of the Higgs that was announced recently, how long, you know, how far into the next run okay, okay, do you so get the evidence to... Uh, I think, so the next run starts in March 2016. Yeah. Um, if the run goes well and they get plenty of data, as I think it probably will go, um, then I think probably next year's, uh, certainly next year's data will be enough to convince physicists whether it's, whether it's really there or not. And so maybe we might hear the end of next year. Maybe yeah, next something like that. Here. Something like that. No. And also, if you get if the atlas, I mean, even if CMS got more data on its own and their their bump looked like the atlas one, then everyone would be convinced. I mean, um, it may not be enough for a, enough evidence for a Nobel Prize, but the physicists would would know. I think. Yeah. And the um, the other thing that was interesting in the announcements yesterday was that um, there were these comments to do with. Uh, well, now half of the room knows more than the other half, and what we didn't realise um, was so there's two experiments, and and but apparently part of the sort of rules of play are that they're not allowed to tell each other yeah, what they've right. discovered. So can you tell us about that? That's right. So the um, it's on purpose. It's kept secret from uh, so that each experimental collaboration, which there are two or three thousand people, um, they will know their data, but they they're supposed to keep it secret until they announce it from the rest of the world. And from crucially from the other experiment, mm -hmm. and that's why is that important? That's because you want the two experiments to be absolutely independent, and you don't. But if one finds something, you don't want the other one to go and uh, you know try and find the same thing and accidentally kind of psychologically set everything up to look in the same place and find the same thing. You really want an independent um, check. So it's like a blind trial. Really. Yeah, like you don't blind want trials. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and several times, you know. It's really helpful from outside. If one sees uh, a signal like this and the other one really doesn't at all and rules it out, then you know it's just a statistical fluctuation. But it's when they both see something, that's when you start to get exciting. And that's why this is kind of semi-exciting. Mm. Yeah. So basically, until the talks yesterday at CERN, even the scientists working there knew nothing more than maybe a few rumours about what was going to Yeah, about, what about, was about what was in the... They yeah, know yeah. what was in their experiment, yeah. but not what was in the other um, experiment, except for... Three people, mm -hmm. and that's uh, so. Two days before the seminar, I think, the director general of CERN and the head of each experiment, they'd all know. Um, mm. They'd have seen all the data, and they decide how the, who was going to talk first, and so on in the, mm. in the seminar. But, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's very cool. impressive, and and I think a great credit to the scientists that they've actually they can keep that many people 
Yeah, well, it's not in practice. Not it's not so it. easy. Yeah. I mean, in theory, okay, we started <laughs> hearing rumours about this about a week ago, um, and we shouldn't have. They try and keep everything totally watertight within the collaborations. But there are, you know, husband and wife teams, who one of which are on each experiment, and they gossip. So <laughs> it's a bit of a leaky bucket. But, yeah. but actually, we didn't know too much um, detail. And I know that people who've been ambulance chasing this, trying to explain it with new theories of Higgs's and things, they didn't know what the mass was. They'd heard various rumours, and so they'd uh, been writing papers with three different ver- three different values of the mass just uh you know and then picking the one yesterday that they said in the talk. I, I love the idea of ambulance chasing theoretical physicists. <laughs> <laughs> there were nine I had a bet yesterday yeah. with someone in King's College London. Uh, he thought there would be ten papers today appearing on the internet um, ambulance chasing this. I, I thought that was uh, an overestimate. I thought there would be two. And uh, so whoever was closest has to buy the other one a pint. And there were nine. There were so nine. you're buying the drinks. I'm buying the drinks, yeah. So nine papers overnight, basically. Um, yeah, well, they've, they've been pre- started a week ago, but they, yeah. they put them on the internet last night, yeah. yeah. Well, this kind of leads us to another um, uh, sort of announcement that happened yesterday relating to a data bump that was found or that people knew about since the summer, which I talked to you about recently as well, and you said that that kind of generated 40 papers or something like that within a very short period of time. So... Um, first of all, I mean, can you say what that bump related to and um, what we know about it now? Sure. So, so that bump um, was, again, found in Atlas. Um, it was 2,000 times the mass of the proton. So it, it indicated a particle, a new particle. New particle. 2,000 times the mass of the proton. That's right. <coughs> uh, it, was, it was at about the kind of three-ish sigma level. Um, and it's strong it, evidence. Which is, uh, yeah, um, that's right. Evidence. That's right. That's what how we call it. Uh, mm-hmm. And it decays into. We <coughs> couldn't really exactly tell what it was decaying into, but it was decaying into either uh, a W boson, W boson, W boson, and Z boson, or a Z boson and Z boson. So it was those three uh, cases. And uh, yeah, there was a. There's been I don't know. I think about sixty papers now on that since August. Um, so that was one of the big things we were looking out for in the talk yesterday because we thought that the higher energy run, even though they got a lot less data, should be roughly similar sensitivity to the first run of the LHC. Um, And in fact, uh, they didn't see any bump. And so uh, initially when I was watching it, my heart sank because we had one of the ambulance chasing papers. Um, (laughs) But but when I looked into it in more detail, actually, they didn't quite get sensitivity to see um, the same bump. So the sensitivity wasn't quite as good. But that question will definitely be answered next year. So we make, at the moment we just can't say. Yeah, it's we just don't know. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. So that might still turn out. To be. Yeah. And what about other things that were being looked for? So of course they they did a, an amazing job in in only a few weeks. They managed to analyse all these different searches. Um, I guess when you've got three thousand people, you can do a lot of work. <laughs> um, but they did. Um, so one of the things I was interested in were all the different supersymmetry searches because I work a lot on supersymmetry. And unfortunately, it's a bit depressing. Um, yeah, uh, so there were a good 10 or so searches, and uh, nothing, it all came back empty handed. Um, and some of them are more sensitive than run one a bit, so they're starting to eat away at the supersymmetry mm. uh, parameter space. So that was a shame, but uh, that's that's the world we live in, and uh, that's how it goes. But there was a long time with Higgs searches where they were slowly eating away parameter space on, on the potential. Va- uh, uh, energy level of the Higgs. That's right. So it could just be that they haven't found it yet. That's right. Yeah. But but do you have a do you have a feel for supersymmetry is a bit different to the Higgs because um, with the Higgs, so, um, it was uh, easy to find uh, a kind of heavyish one. When it got really light, it was more difficult. It's the other way around with supersymmetry. The, um, light supersymmetry, you you can find and rule out very early, and um, Supersymmetry is set up to solve this problem with the Higgs mass, and it only solves it if it's not too heavy. So you start ruling out the interesting parameter space first, and then eventually you just lose interest. And that's what they've right. done. They're well, not quite yet, not but but it's getting it's going towards that. Yeah. So they're sort of munching away at that. So it sounds like a really exciting time to be in particle physics at the moment. Yeah, that's right. I think this year, I'm, I've got high hopes for this year. There could well be a discovery. This might this might be it. The um, the die photons, and uh, yeah, I look forward to the next run a lot. 
Um, now, just before we go, um, I think it's important that everyone knows uh, what makes a good particle physicist and what is required for excellent um, free radical. <laughs> and I think we just have to close to on a shot you. of Ben's shoes. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Essential. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.